I edit a magazine called Improbable Research, and 29 years ago, I created a ceremony that happens every year that's called the Ig Nobel Prize Ceremony. I'm going to tell you about both of those things. They're related. They're all about this. This prize, this Ig Nobel Prize, is for this criterion, and it's the only criterion. It's for things that make people laugh and then think, things that when you first encounter it, it's funny, and then there's something about it that sticks in your head so that a week later, you just want to tell your friends about it. That's the quality we look for. Every other prize in the world, at least I think every other prize, is different. It's for something that's the best, like the Olympics are for the best uh, athletic performance, or the Nobel Prizes are for the most uh, accomplished scientific whatever, or there are a few prizes for the worst, the worst movie, the worst dressed. Best, worst, important, not important, that doesn't matter to us, it's just this one thing. I'm gonna begin by showing you one Canadian man who won an Ig Nobel Prize, who's uh, become a favorite of many people around the world. And a little background uh, about grizzly bears. You don't have many grizzly bears in Saudi Arabia, at least last time I checked. They're big and they're powerful. They're really big and they're really powerful. And Troy Hurtabies is the name of this man. He was in the woods in Canada where there are grizzly bears and he met a grizzly bear one time, and that was such a, a powerful experience to him, he decided he had to go out and spend more time in the woods with a grizzly bear. But it's dangerous. They could kill you very easily, and they probably will kill you very easily. So he decided to do something to make it safe for him to spend time in the woods with a grizzly bear. And we gave him a prize, uh, an Ig Nobel Prize, in the field of safety engineering for doing this. He went to, as I said, the man named Troy Hurtabies, for developing and personally testing a suit of armor that's impervious to grizzly bears, he hopes. He spent years doing this. <laughs> good enough for those yeah. so what we did was uh, we built another suit uh, which we had planned to do and yeah. um, redid the test this time magnified them to to uh, how would one say refute all uh -huh. uh, we uh, we pushed the trucks up to three ton trucks uh, 50 kilometers an hour uh, and then of course put the a three ton truck three ton truck. 50 kilometers an hour uh, 18 times <laughs> okay. i hope you will agree that that deserves some kind of prize and it got a prize. Every year we give 10 of these prizes. Uh, we get nominations. Anybody can send in a nomination, and in a typical year we get about 10,000 new nominations for Ig Nobel Prizes. Uh, we also, anything that we did not give a prize to in the past, we'll consider it again. So the pool, after now 29 years, is enormous of potential winners. And of course there are seven billion people all doing things all day long. Uh, I think it's important for you to know that when we choose somebody to win a prize or choose a team to win a prize, we offer it to them. We offer it to them quietly. We give them the chance, if they want to, to say no. But I'm happy to report that almost everybody who is offered a prize says yes. And uh, I'll show you a little bit about what happens. We have a ceremony, happens in September in the US at Harvard University. 
And if you win an Ig Nobel Prize, you win an Ig Nobel Prize. It's a different design every year. They're always handmade from extremely cheap materials. This was the prize from 2017. This was the prize the next year. The ceremony features at its heart the uh, 10 new Ig Nobel Prize winners who are kept secret until the moment they appear on stage. They travel from around the world to be there. And we, uh, in between announcing the prizes, we do a lot of other stuff really fast, including even every year we write a little opera about something funny in science, and that's performed. And there's a lot of other stuff that happens. This is the prize that we gave just a month ago in this year's ceremony. Um, I'm not even going to describe the details of that. You can see some of it for yourself. And up on stage in this theater where we have it, Sanders Theater, it's the biggest theater at Harvard, it's the biggest classroom at Harvard University, it fits 1,100 people, it's always completely filled. Up on stage, there are a bunch of Nobel Prize winners waiting to shake hands with the winners and to physically hand them the Ig Nobel Prizes. This photo was taken a few years ago when we had nine Nobel Prize winners up on stage waiting to hand the prizes out. Uh, there are a few other people there. And you might notice there's a little girl in the middle. She, in a way, is the most important person in that whole ceremony because we had a problem in the early years, and it's a problem I'm sure you're familiar with. It happens at almost every public event where there are many people who are going to give speeches, and they all have a lot to say, and it's hard to keep them from saying that and then going on talking. But how do you, how do you politely get everybody to finish early? After many years of thought, we finally came up with a method. And the method involves the little girl. We recruit a very special, very cute, little eight-year-old girl every year. She sits on the stage. And whenever she feels that somebody has already been, been talking too long, she'll stand up. She walks, this cute little girl, she walks all the way across the stage. She goes up to the person who's talking, and she looks up at that person, and she says, please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. She does not stop until they do. And it works. Now, we don't really have any money, so the winner is when they come, they have to find their own way to travel from wherever they live in the world over to Massachusetts, where we are. But a few years ago, we figured out a way that we could give them some cash. We give them a lot of cash. Every winner now gets $10 trillion. They get a $10 trillion bill from the country of Zimbabwe. And you may know that Zimbabwe has an interesting history with its money, that they had uh, adventures in inflation. The government official in Zimbabwe, the head of the National Bank, who was responsible for creating these $10 trillion bills, and also $100 trillion bills, himself was awarded an Ig Nobel Prize for doing that. His was in the field of mathematics. And this is what it looks like at Sanders Theater. There's a tradition that started early on, I think the second year, where a lot of people in the audience who come to, to the show uh, bring big stacks of paper with them and they make paper airplanes. So imagine, if you will, 1,100 people throwing paper airplanes. They, those airplanes, they pile up on the stage so quickly, we find it necessary to have several people whose job for the whole night is to take brooms and sweep, because if they don't do that, we can't walk around. All right, here's a quick look at a few of the many Ig Nobel Prize winners. One of the prizes we gave in the category of physics one year went to a man named Ji Won Han, who is a high school student in South Korea. He was honored for studying the dynamics of liquid sloshing. Sloshing means goes back and forth. And this is a technical term in engineering. Dynamics is a technical term, means movement, and liquid sloshing is a technical term. Uh, he studied the dynamics of liquid sloshing to learn what happens when a person walks backwards while carrying a cup of coffee. 
Now, he was inspired to do this by an earlier Ig Nobel Prize that we gave to some physics professors who had spent a long time figuring out in theory and by testing what happens when a person walks forward holding a full cup of coffee. And it turned out to be a much more interesting story in both cases than any of the scientists expected. What happens is when you walk forwards, um, I expect everybody here has experienced this, if the cup is very full and you hold it like this and you walk normally at a regular pace, it's going to spill. And you might think it's because of something some, that's wrong with you. You're, you're clumsy or something. But no matter who you are, it's almost certainly going to spill if you're walking normally because you get into a rhythm. Da -da -da -da. And when you get into a rhythm, the water in there gets into a rhythm. And you know what happens when you're doing something rhythmically. It goes more and more and more, and that's why it spills. And that's what happens when you walk forwards. But this high school student in South Korea reading about this wondered what happens when you walk backwards. And it turns out it's a different story. You're not as likely to spill it. Because when most people walk backwards, you don't get into that rhythm. You halt like this. And so the water doesn't get the chance to do this. Now, I would like to have a very quick demonstration. If we have four volunteers, we have four cups of coffee here. Could you please bring those out? Do we have four volunteers? Okay, just one, two, uh, three, and four. Could you just come up over right here? And if you could, yep, fill those right to the top. Okay, come on right up over here, please. Okay, thank you all. You could stand right here. Each of you, please. Uh, Come right up here. I'll get you water for Okay, me. great. Um, if you, one of you could stand here, facing this way. Yeah. Okay, here's your coffee. Please do not drink it. Okay, if you could stand right here, next to him. And here's your coffee. Okay, it's very full. Okay, be careful with it. Okay, and if you could stand right next to her. Okay. Good, thank you. Here's yours. Okay. And wait right there. I'd like you to hold, hold it out as far as you can, and don't move yet. When, when I say go, not yet, but when I say go, walk over to me quickly, normally and quickly. Okay. So, all right, go. Now stop. <laughs> All right, now stay right there. And now I'm going to go over there, and I'd like you to walk backwards. But wait until I say go. All right, are you ready? Go. <laughs> stop, stop, stop. stop. <laughs> and that's the demonstration. Thank you very much. For our volunteers. Oh my goodness, you probably can't see it quite so well from where you are, but this stage is a mess right now. <laughs> okay, thank you again to all of our volunteers. This is the scientific paper published by the high school student in a good physics journal. It's called A Study on the Coffee Spilling Phenomena in the Low Impulse Regime, and it's a very complicated piece of work. Uh, here he is at the Ig Nobel ceremony, giving his acceptance speech, uh, holding up a cup of coffee. You may notice that there's a man next to him painted silver. Is anybody curious about why there is that man there? He is a human spotlight. His job is to, he has a flashlight, his job is to illuminate the proceedings. Uh, the man doing that is named Jim Brett. He's actually Dr. Jim Brett. He has a PhD from MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's an inventor. He has many patents. I think he has two inventions that are especially interesting in the world. One is he invented this idea of the human spotlight. The other is, you've heard of something called 3D printing, three-dimensional printing? That's one of the people who invented it. Same guy. 
Oh, also a hand for our mop sweeper. Thank you. Good. We gave another, in a different year, we gave an Ig Nobel Physics Prize to a team of scientists from Australia who published a scientific report about some research they had done called An Analysis of the Forces Required to Drag Sheep Over Various Surfaces. This is their paper, an analysis of the forces required to drag sheep over various surfaces, and this photo from their paper shows you some of the work being done. Um, when I called them up on the telephone and offered them the prize, that telephone call was the first moment any of them realized that what they'd done is funny. <laughs> we gave an Ig Nobel Prize in the field of psychology one year to, uh, in fact, this year, to a German scientist called Fritz Strack for discovering that holding a pen in one's mouth, like this, discovering that holding a pen in one's mouth makes one smile, which makes one happy. And for then, later, discovering that, no, it, it does not. This was the first paper he published years ago. You can see it has got a long title. And then he thought about it for many years, and he, he decided that, you know, maybe the evidence was not so good. And he did some more experiments, and then published this later paper saying that, you know, maybe it's not true. So this is a very interesting thing that happens in science, where good scientists are not embarrassed to really check what they've done and see, is it? Is it right what we did, or could we have been mistaken? And here he is, Fritz Strzok, at the Ig Nobel ceremony with his prize. We gave the psychology prize another year to a psychologist named Lawrence Sherman for a report that he wrote and published in a research journal called An Ecological Study of Glee in small groups of preschool children. He studied glee, you know, this intense, sudden, wee happiness in young kids. And there it is, you can get a copy from the library, and what he discovered is, yes, it happens. You get big groups of kids together, you put them in certain situations, and it's gonna start happening. One kid feels gleeful, starts shouting, and suddenly they all do. And he had a very happy time doing this research. We gave the Ig Nobel Literature Prize one year to a team of three scientists uh, who were in several different countries working together for discovering that the word huh or its equivalent seems to exist in every human language. And they won the prize also for not being completely sure why. <laughs> right. Now, you have an equivalent word in Arabic. What is the word for huh? All right. The, um, most of the winners are able to travel to the ceremony. These ones weren't, so they sent us a very short acceptance speech that I'm going to show you on video. Now, this is the paper that they published, is ha a universal word. And if I had a little more time, I'd explain it. It's, it's much more interesting what they discovered about why this happens. Much more interesting than you might at all guess. And here's their acceptance speech. Huh? Mm -hmm. huh? You want to see that again? Huh? 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 We gave a prize in the field of Arctic science. So we had to invent that category to some scientists up in uh, in Norway for testing how reindeer react to seeing humans who are disguised as polar bears. They published this paper, it's got a long title, which I won't read, and this is what they were interested in. You know that um, up in the Arctic area, the ice is melting. It's not as cold for as much of the year as it used to be. And when the ice melts, the polar bears don't have as much ice to live on. So there's, the polar bears are starting to spend more time on land, and the animals there are soon going to be seeing a lot more polar bears, which are very dangerous for them. So these scientists were wondering, what are the reindeer going to do when they start seeing polar bears? Are they going to run? Are they going to freeze? Are they going to get eaten? What's going to happen? Well, how do you answer a question like this? How do you test it? 
And this is what they thought of. They said, well, we can't, re- we, we can't control a polar bear, but we'll put an imitation polar bear. And how do you imitate a polar bear? Well, <laughs> that's what they did. And as you can see, they say this, these are their own words. There was an astonishing similarity here. And here are the winners at the ceremony being reminded that it's time for them to finish their speech. And I'll show you one last Ig Nobel Prize of the th- almost 300 prizes we've given. This went to a large international team that was based in Italy. They won a prize for discovering that some people would be physically capable of running across the surface of a pond if those people and that pond were on the moon. So you know, you probably have thought a little bit about what it would be like to be on the moon, which is much smaller than the Earth, and the force of gravity is much weaker there. You know that you've seen the films of astronauts bouncing along, and they wondered, Is the gravity weak enough there, the pull of gravity weak enough that you could, you know, walk? No, you couldn't walk maybe, but if you ran fast enough, could you maybe run across the surface of the water? Well, how do you test that? That's what their paper was about. And the last thing I'm going to show you is they filmed some of their experiments. So here's what they could come up with as a way to try to test their idea. Uh, They made a machine that would try to simulate the lower gravity pull on the moon. And there you are. <laughs> Next year's ceremony will be the 30th, first annual Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. It's in September. We webcast it. We pretty much invented webcasting. We, we didn't realize at the time, but back in 1995, we've been webcasting the ceremony every year since. Oh, I hope you can uh, travel over and get a ticket and be in the audience, but if you can't, I hope you'll watch the webcast. And you can see video on our website of most of the past ceremonies. Um, the last thing I want to say is that if you uh, run across somebody, you hear of somebody who you think deserves an Ig Nobel Prize, You think whatever they've done will make anybody in the world laugh and then think. Let us know. This is how we learn about most of the people who win prizes. Usually it's one person sees this and lets us know. Um, And uh, I guess I'll, I'll finish with the sentence I say at the end of every Ig Nobel Prize ceremony every year. If you did not win an Ig Nobel Prize this year, And especially if you did, better luck next year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, for that. And I wanted to ask you a question. First of all, would you like to smile? No, this is for you. Oh. Oh. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you so much for the pen. (laughs) Um, I wanted to ask you if any Saudis has ever won the ID Nobel Award. Yes, the Ig Nobel Prize. Yeah. Yes, this year, a month ago, one of the prizes went to a Saudi scientist and his team. They won a prize for doing some experiments about itching and scratching. (laughs) They were trying to figure out um, what they called they were trying to measure on different parts of your body what they called the pleasurability of scratching an itch. (laughs) And so they got people, they made people itchy on several parts of their body and they discovered that the, the, the most pleasurable places, in other words, scratching it makes you feel so much better. The three places that they say are most common to give you the most relief and the most pleasure are the neck, the ankles, and the back. Now, everybody's a little different, so you may find some other body part works. And if so, I would urge you, get in touch with these scientists because they probably would enjoy hearing this new data from you. All right. All right, I guess that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and thank you. Thank you for the pen. (laughs) All right.